summer 1950. On a quiet beach on the coast of Florida, a rocket is readied for launch at a newly built launch site. The rocket is called Bumper Whack, and it's been created from a German V-2 missile by a team of scientists, soldiers, and aerospace experts who have turned this weapon of war into a powerful research tool. The launch of a Bumper Whack rocket in July 1950 is the first flight from America's Cape Canaveral launch range capping a research program that began with the end of World War II as German rocket technology and talent arrived in the United States. The story of the rocket that would eventually be known as the V-2 began in the early 1930s. The German army chose to support the work of the country's small but enthusiastic rocketry clubs eventually bringing key members of these groups under direct military supervision. Among their members was a talented young engineer, Werner von Braun, who had not yet even graduated from engineering school. Von Braun would go on to lead the technical team that designed the A-4 rocket. After years of development, the A-4 finally flew successfully in October of 1942. The rocket was soon pressed into battle, becoming the world's first ballistic missile. Designed to carry a one-ton warhead to a target 200 miles away, the A-4 was used against the cities of London, Paris, and Antwerp, killing over 2,700 in London alone. The Nazi leadership recognized the potential of the A-4 as a terror weapon and renamed the missile the V-2, or Vengeance Weapon No. 2. While the V-2 represented a huge leap in technology and was greatly feared as a weapon of terror, it was a failure as a tactical tool on the battlefield. The rocket was ruinously expensive. No other single weapon project pursued by the Third Reich consumed more time, money, or material resources, and the demands of the weapon did not decrease once missiles reached the battlefield. 30 tons of potatoes were required to produce the alcohol needed for a single V-2 launch, robbing Germany's population of much-needed food supplies at the end of the war. Historians have suggested that 24,000 aircraft could have been built instead of the V-2's estimated production of only 6,000 missiles. Perhaps the most shocking statistic is that the V-2 killed more people during development and production than died from the missile's use as a weapon, largely due to the horrific conditions at the infamous Middlework production plant. As Nazi Germany began to collapse under the advance of Allied forces, a scramble to seize the secrets of the V-2 rocket erupted. American, British, and Soviet teams scoured the country searching for V-2 parts, technical documentation, and most importantly, the teams that had developed the missile. Von Braun and his team had wisely anticipated this demand for their expertise. One member of the group is alleged to have said, We despise the French. We are mortally afraid of the Soviets. We do not believe that the British can afford us, so that leaves the Americans. By early May 1945, key members of the V-2 development team were in U.S. military custody, turning over 14 tons of technical documents. American forces set out to gather parts, tooling, and support gear to assemble as many as 100 V-2s, stuffing rail cars full of equipment for the trip back to the United States. By early September, the first of over 100 German rocket team members began arriving at Fort Bliss, Texas. The fact that many of them were guilty of atrocities committed during the war was quickly covered up in the interest of gaining access to their technical talent and experience. The British were the first to order a post-war launch of the V-2 as part of Operation Backfire. Three Backfire launches took place in October 1945 on the coast of Germany near the town of Cuxhaven with Allied experts watching German tactical missile troops demonstrate the V-2 under battlefield conditions. Among those in attendance was Sergei Korolev, who would later head the Soviet Union's space program. Korolev would build upon the missile's design by creating the V-2-based 
R-1 and R-2, his country's first ballistic missiles, and would draw upon V-2 technology to build the powerful Vostok and Soyuz boosters. Like von Braun, Korolev was not only a gifted engineer, he was also a remarkable leader. Even as the German rocket team was arriving in America, it was clear that the V-2 was already obsolete as a weapon, given the missile's limited range and payload. The defeat of Japan following the atomic bomb drops on Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed that the ballistic missiles of the future would need to carry much heavier nuclear warheads over much greater distances. Almost immediately, von Braun and his team started work on the next generation of battlefield missiles and continued work on anti-aircraft weapons started in the last years of the war. With the Germans arriving in El Paso, 300 boxcars full of V-2 parts were on their way to the White Sands Proving Ground in southern New Mexico. While the V-2s were useless as weapons, the U.S. Army was quick to realize the research and training potential of the German missiles. The General Electric Company was signed to run V-2 launch operations at White Sands, and a science panel was pulled together to oversee the research potential of the rockets, the Upper Atmosphere Research Panel. This group was made up of representatives from the Naval Research Laboratory, GE, the U.S. Army Signal Corps, and leading universities such as Johns Hopkins, Michigan, and Harvard. Their task was to consider proposals from researchers to carry scientific payloads on board the V-2 rockets, such as experiments studying solar radiation, X-ray astronomy, upper atmosphere research, and the new field of space biology. None of the captured V-2 rockets arrived at White Sands in flyable condition, and each rocket had to be individually assembled and tested before flight. Certain parts were in short supply, especially guidance instruments, and U.S. companies were called upon to build replacements. New gyroscopes were sourced from Bendix and Honeywell, while the Douglas Aircraft Company built entire V-2 tail assemblies. On the other hand, many parts were in great supply. The Germans were surprised to find that the Americans had shipped boxcars full of fiberglass insulation over from Europe material that could easily have been purchased at local stores. American V-2 researchers improved the performance of the rocket throughout the launch program, and by the end of the project, researchers had increased payload capacity by almost half. A test stand was constructed in the nearby Oregon Mountains, and the first static firing of a V-2 rocket in America occurred on March 15, 1946. The first American launch of the rocket was attempted on April 16 from the newly constructed Army Launch Area 1. The flight was not successful. A fin separated from the rocket soon after launch, causing the V-2 to spin out of control, only reaching an altitude of five miles. A second launch attempt on May 10th was more successful, carrying a Johns Hopkins University-supplied cosmic radiation experiment to an altitude of 69 miles. Although the flight's Geiger counter and wire recorder failed to return any usable data, the era of V-2 rocket research in America was underway. While the first V-2 flights at White Sands used a standard battlefield warhead, the Naval Gun Factory designed and built a versatile research nose cone that could be fitted with a wide range of scientific instruments. Certain flights were fitted with specialized equipment for more specific applications, such as this University of Michigan upper atmosphere sampling flight. Without a heavy warhead in place, Researchers often had to add weight to the nose of the V-2 in order to ensure a stable flight. Many of the research flights carried motion picture and still cameras, some of which were supplied by the National Geographic Society. The Army's Air Research Development Command also participated in the White Sands V-2 program. Many of these flights were known as Project Blossom, an early program designed to study the effects of rocket flight and upper atmosphere exposure to biological payloads 
and then recover the payload by parachute. Working with scientists from the nearby Holloman Air Force Base, Blossom Flight sent passengers as varied as fruit flies, mice, and even small primates to the edge of space. Blossom Flight number one carried a nine-pound rhesus monkey named Albert, the first animal astronaut. Unfortunately, telemetry showed that Albert probably died before launch, and none of his later animal colleagues survived later flights in the Blossom series due to recovery failures. One of the Blossom flights tested a subscale version of the detachable escape capsule planned for the Bell X-2 research aircraft. The U.S. Navy also took part in the American V-2 flight program, beginning with Operation Sandy, the September 1947 launch of a V-2 from the deck of the aircraft carrier USS Midway. Although the rocket reached an altitude of less than a mile, the Sandy Project proved that a missile could be safely launched from the deck of a ship. A later Navy program called Operation Pushover tested the effects of a rocket explosion on board a warship. A simulated deck was constructed on the range at White Sands and then a fully fueled flight ready V-2 was deliberately toppled over and exploded. Perhaps the most ambitious flights of the American V-2 program were the Bumper Wax series, the first flights of a practical two-stage rocket. The V-2 was used as a booster for a modified, liquid-fueled Army WAC research rocket designed by a team from the Jet Propulsion Lab at the California Institute of Technology. The Bumper WAC combination was designed for both high-altitude and high-speed research. The wax slid into rails in the modified nose of the V-2 booster and would be ignited at the appropriate point in the flight profile. The first flight in the bumper series took place at White Sands on May 13, 1948, reaching an altitude of 78 miles. While the next three flights failed, bumper whack round B-5 reached an altitude of 244 miles the highest altitude of any flight in the V-2 series. The Bumper Whack program then moved to a remote launch site on the coast of Florida for the next series of launches. On July 24, 1950, Bumper Whack Round B-8 became the first rocket to fly from Cape Canaveral, inaugurating what would become America's most important launch site. Five days later, another bumper flight rose from the same launch pad, reaching a maximum altitude of 31 miles and a speed of Mach 9. The V-2 flight program in America came to an end on September 19, 1952, with the White Sands launch of TF-5, a training flight conducted solely by Army personnel. TF-5 only reached an altitude of four miles, closing this early chapter in the story of America's space program. A total of 70 V-2 rockets had been launched in the U.S. after the close of the war. 67 of those flights took place at White Sands, and 68% of those launches were considered successful. In the early days of his career, Werner von Braun often expressed a hope that his work would someday lead to the exploration of space. Working for the U.S. Army Ballistic Missile Agency, von Braun and his team designed and flew the Redstone and Jupiter rockets and used that work as the basis for the booster that lofted America's first satellite into space. On January 31, 1958, a Jupiter C booster a direct descendant of the V-2 missile, put Explorer 1 into orbit. Von Braun would go on to lead the team that designed the Saturn V booster, which helped put men on the moon in July 1969. The legacy of the V-2 is undeniable. It was forged as a weapon of war, killing thousands both on the assembly line and in the targeted cities of Europe 
serving an evil regime as a symbol of cruelty and terror. In the post-war years, however, it became a symbol of progress, a powerful research and teaching tool for the generation that would place the first footprints on the surface of the moon.